today at the close of the sermon time, we'll be sharing in Holy Communion, and I want to give um, a little bit of instructions now because I don't want to do it later. Uh, first of all, if you're visiting, you might not know, but there's a secret little ledge right behind the uh, kneeling rail to put your cup. And uh, I know folks feel unusual when they come to shake hands after service and they go, I didn't know what to do with this. So uh, <laughs> there's a little, sec a little secret hiding place right there. Also, uh, I, um, if the rails are full and you want to kneel or sit on the front pew, feel, feel uh, totally free to do that. Mostly what I want to say to you about communion is that everyone is welcome. Uh, you don't have to be a Methodist. You don't have to be a member. And don't worry about anything. Don't worry about how long you stay. Don't worry about if you have a hole in your shoe or if your clothes match. Just don't worry about what anyone else is thinking. Just let it be a time between you and our Father. Uh, so today we're continuing, our, continuing in our series from the book of Isaiah. And I continue to be uh, interested in how the very same things that he was talking to people about 2,500 years ago, they're still going on exactly the same problems, exactly the same issues today. We haven't gotten any smarter uh, since the prophet Isaiah spoke. Uh, to, uh, last week, we, we talked about, uh, hey, all of you who are thirsty, come, come to the waters. And I hope that you have had some time in your life where you have been thirsty, where you have been hungry uh, to know more of, of, of God. Uh, today, uh, the, the sermon is a reminder that we are dependent upon God. His ways are higher. His ways are different. His thoughts are higher. His thoughts are different. And in this life, we will find meaning uh, when we get that... Um, well, when we get that relationship put in a right perspective. So let's stand for our scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord. He will have mercy on them. And turn to our God. He will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. We don't like to be dependent, do we? I don't want to need a ride. I want to drive my own car. We're self-made people in America. We like to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. I mean, that's how I was raised. Don't ever ask for help. Just figure it out and do it yourself. And don't expect anybody to pat you on the back. Just God helps those who help themselves. And, you know, to some degree, there's not anything wrong with that. But there's also a little arrogance uh, that, that sweeps through that kind of thinking that I got this, I don't need anyone else. And the moment we start thinking like that and, and start leaving God out of the equation, we find all kinds of trouble. I think if we're paying attention to life, life has a way of teaching us. And it takes a lot of us a long time to learn these lessons uh, to, to, to teach us that we need each other and we need someone bigger than ourselves, and that someone is God. Well, uh, it's interesting how there's all kinds of things in life we're dependent on uh, that we just kind of take for granted. Take, for example, when I was a kid, uh, how many TV channels were there in Kansas City? Three, unless you got UHF, then there was four, but 41 was kind of in and out, so you got three and a half, three and a half channels in Kansas City. Now what happens if my favorite show isn't on as scheduled on one of the 500 channels that we have? I'm upset. What happens if that baseball game is blacked out for some kind of a reason? Heaven forbid the cable should go out. Heaven forbid the satellite should be in a storm. And we're just so used to having all of this stuff just go our way. Uh, how about email? Are you dependent on, on email? I meet people that don't have email and I think that would be a great life. Um, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't too many years ago, every stitch of business that we did during the day was either done in person or on the phone. 
How many emails do you send and receive in one day? I mean, a, a lot, a lot. Can you imagine how long the day would be if every single person we emailed or got an email from, we had to speak to in person or on the phone? I mean, we'd be coming to work like three in the morning, and we'd be going home about two in the morning. I mean, it, it's amazing how we have become dependent on this uh, technology. And how about your cell phone? Hey, why don't you get your cell phones out and just let me collect them? I promise not to change the language or do anything funny to them. You have your phone with you? Can I have it? Oh, you're too trusting. You know, we, we, we just love to have these phones, don't we? They're just so important to us. My children, uh, I, I look at their face, I go, you didn't sleep for it. What's going on? Oh, my friends were texting me at two in the morning, and then so-and-so called, and I'm going, why is your phone anywhere near your bed? I mean, throw it somewhere else, sleep, for heaven's sakes, give yourself eight hours without uh, a phone. Oh, but no, the phones are so important, and it's not just my kids, is it? Did you hear about the guy last week who um, uh, the Broadway play was beginning to start, and his phone was dying? We won't mention his name, just his initials. <laughs> You know where that's going. Nick Silvestri, uh, he's all over the news now. Uh, his phone was dying, and he couldn't fathom the thought, so he snuck up on the stage of the Broadway play, New York City Broadway play, and, and he plugs in his charger and his phone. What he doesn't realize is that it's a set and that the electrical outlet is just a fake. Um, <laughs> but we've all had so much fun uh, uh, making fun of this, partly because... We've been real worried a time or two, too, that, that we were losing charge, and we might not be able to communicate with somebody, and how desperately difficult it would be if we couldn't talk to somebody for a, a few hours. Uh, I love, personally, the GPS, the map thing uh, on the phone. I was in Houston a few weeks ago, and I was going to visit some other churches, and I've never been to Houston, and it's a big, big big, really big, everything in Texas is really big, and Houston is the biggest of all. But you know, I just plug in a few numbers and push the button, and there's a woman who lives in my phone. <laughs> and she tells me where to go and where to turn and how long it's going to take to get there, and it's just amazing. And of course, without that, there is no way I would be able to navigate uh, around, around Houston. Well, um, today I, I want to remind you because we forget. Every stitch of your life, the breath that you breathe, the beating of your heart is held in the hands of Almighty God. So quickly we forget that. You know, it's interesting, we kind of cruise along through life, and if, if that wall is the beginning and that wall is the end, I'll just want to believe I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, but but if, you, if you look back and you think of all the things that have happened in your life, all the times along the way, the good things, the bad things, the good decisions, the bad decisions the time when you felt your heart strangely warmed and you, you leaned into a relationship with God and the time that you uh, made some bad decisions and went the other way. All along this journey, every step of the way, you have been cradled in the hands of our loving, amazing Father. Theologians talk about the God-shaped hole inside of each person uh, as though there's a, a cookie cutter or a puzzle shape inside of each of us that's, that's empty until something, something fills it. And of course, we try to fill it with all kinds of things, but only God can fill the God-shaped hole in our lives. Uh, we like to talk about the, the concept of soul. I have a soul. I have a soul. Well, I would like for us to remember, it's not just that you have a soul. You are a soul. You know, it's the you that's you isn't what you see in the mirror. This part, the skin and hair and whatever you got, it's going to go away. It's just the house. You are a soul. And so the hole in our soul must be filled with something different than what we find on this 
earth. St. Augustine wrote, You formed us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in you. Rick Warren, in his famous book, The Purpose Driven Life, said, You were made by God and for God, and until we understand that, life will never make sense. Now, I would like to send you home at this point, end the sermon, uh, with that on your mind. Uh, But I can't, because someone will not be happy that the the sermon was too short. But uh, um, uh, just, just think about that and how it might change a person's life. I, I, you, me, uh, we were made by God and for God. When we start to get that through our thick head, life starts to make sense. You ever had a time in your life when life didn't make sense? This sort of disequilibrium, it's, it's hard to explain, but you know something's not right. You can feel the tension, and what do we usually do? We keep trying harder, doing the same things to fix it. But chasing dollars, chasing fame, chasing toys, whatever we're doing, never is going to fill that hole. Only an awareness that we were created to be in a loving relationship with God. And and when we make that step and we open our hearts again and we remember that his ways are higher and that we need him desperately, That's when life starts to feel right, good, congruent, copacetic. That's when we understand what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that we are the children of God. Not the ones in charge of God, not the ones in charge of life, but we are his children. You ever had an arrogant streak? You ever had somebody in your family that had an arrogant streak? Now we're going to get some of this. Wake up. He's talking about you. Uh, My mom used to like to say, and uh, she didn't just say it. She enjoyed saying it to me, and she would say it with tone. There's more Horatio than is dreamt of in your philosophy. Now, as a teenager, I didn't really know exactly what that meant, but she took her time to explain to me that, Jeff, you're just not as smart as you think. You think you just know all this stuff. You're not as smart as you think. And friends, in this life, when we start to get full of ourselves, we start to decide we know and we got it. And even, you know, even if someone stopped us and said, what are you doing? We'd acknowledge, oh yeah, that's right. God's ways are higher. But then we just keep going. Just keep pressing after the same things. God wants to remind us, I have thoughts I have ways, and they are higher than yours. A few weeks ago, we were finishing up the series uh, on fruit of the Spirit, and we talked about love, and one of the things that the pastor said in the sermon was that healthy human relationships are not two broken people propping each other up. Healthy human relationships are not two dominoes uh, uh, going like this, Uh, but in a relationship with God, dependence And the notion of dependence is very important for you to understand, for me to understand, I am not a self-made person. I am not a macho man. I am not on top of the world. I, me, Jeff, in this life needs a God that is bigger than me, that I can lean into, that I can fall into, that I can trust. Revelation chapter 4 You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things. By your will they were created and have their being. And we sing this song sometimes around here. You are worthy, O Lord. Uh, In the Bible we see the angels and the heavenly creatures and and all of those residents of heaven, they're, they're singing this song. You are worthy, O Lord. Very interesting phrase very interesting phrase. Imagine your prayer to God. Imagine your prayer to God and that just boils down to nothing more than several versions of you are worthy, Lord. You're it. You're the one. You're the one I need. It's not me. It's not about me. I'm not in charge. You are worthy, O oh Lord. 
You have helped me. You have, you have carried me. You are the one that deserves the thanks. You are the one that deserves this honor. And when I talk like this and I pray like this, inside my heart, I feel the sense that everything is right. And for this moment, for this relationship, we indeed are created. It is so easy for us, though, to go back to our own ways. You know, someone said, life is three steps forward and two steps back. You heard that? I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like life is two steps forward and three steps back, or one step forward and four steps back. Um, I just don't feel like I'm always making the progress that everyone expects me to make, uh, or that, that, th- that I'm not always um, um, becoming s- sweeter. So it's, let's just be honest with ourselves. It's just not always the case that, that things are getting better for us. So we just keep falling back into arrogance. And I think Christians can be just some hard cases. You know, what do they say about new Christians? Lock them up for a year. Let them settle down right? Why? Let them, let them get to be like us. Let them relax. Let them just relax. Let them just, let them just sort of chill out. You know, it's, it's very easy for Christian people to get all sorts of involved in all kinds of religious things and forget the very source, the very core of what all this stuff is about. There's a story of a, a man who uh, learned how to make fire And he went into the northern parts of the country where it's very cold, and he began teaching people in different villages how to make fire. And of course, they were totally enamored because now they could cook their food and and, and they could warm their huts. And and it was so wonderful, and they praised the fire maker. And he went on from village to village, and they were so excited for for the fire maker and the fire. Uh, They began to build uh, uh, great temples to remember him and and worship him. And they, they built stained glass windows with with his picture in there, and they had the fire-making tools on the altar, and they made books of of hymns and songs about the fire maker, how he taught them to make this this fire, this amazing thing, and they wrote liturgies, and they said them, and they gathered every Sunday, and they did all this stuff in this wonderful place. But somewhere along the line of doing all the things, someone forgot to tend the fire, and it went out. So here were all these religious people with their buildings and and hymn books and things, but they'd forgot the fire. Friends, um, it's so easy for us to wake up as Christians and realize the passion for God has left our lives. And I just want to suggest to you today that the passion for God returns to our lives when we come to him and repent and invite him in again and recognize that we need him. Capital N-E-E-D, need him. When I was a young man, I had a pastor, and, and he would sing, without him, I would be nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Thomas Aquinas taught that people come to know God three ways. The first, he said, go look at a bird or a tree, see what God has made, see if it bears witness to you. And all of us have seen beautiful things, and we go, that's amazing. The second thing he said is, think about how all of that stuff came to be. Think about the amazing miracles in, in the world that, that, that are happening to, to make creation be so amazing, the motion, the movement of the planets, how everything is aligned so perfectly in our solar system, how one thing causes the next, how things are interrelated, how one thing is contingent upon another thing, and how, though in a world that you would think could be filled with chaos, there's actually an inordinate amount of, of goodness and wonder and design. He said, think about all of that and believe that there is is a God. But the, uh, he said, the highest form of knowing God is when we come to know the unknown God. And what he was saying isn't that God should not be known or that God could not be known. But what he's saying is that there is a God that is so much bigger than our ideas about him. You remember what you were taught in Sunday school? All the things you learned about God in Sunday school growing up, it's a sliver of the greatness of God. 
The things that we know and think about him now, they're just the slivers, just a drop in the bucket of who God is. And when we begin to pray the prayer, you are worthy, Lord, you are amazing. Our heart, our lives, our, our minds begin to change as we, we relate to him, not, not as someone that we'll see on Sunday if we feel like it, but someone that we need every single day. In the contemporary services, they sing a song, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars and the sky and you know them by name. You are an amazing God. All-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly, humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. If you're here today and your life isn't working very well, we all know that feeling. God welcomes you to start again, to start over, to recognize again the relationship between the creator and the created between the creator and the creation. He invites us to see him, to lean on him, and to find our hope in him. The prophet wrote in Isaiah 40, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in God, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And so this great, amazing, incontainable God welcomes and accepts all who call upon his name.